Good morning. Go ahead and grab your Bible, and you can join me this morning in Romans chapter 12. And uh, if you need a Bible, uh, there's one there in the pew in front of you, and we'd love for you to use that one. That's actually the one that I'll be reading from this morning. And so if you need some help finding Romans chapter 12, it's, uh, it's on page 1006 in that pew Bible. Well, this is, this is a pretty good crowd for, for January 1st. Well done. Now, let, let's see if you stay awake. Okay, that's yet to be determined, but um, you, you got here, and uh, it's so good to see you. How many of you guys stayed up past midnight last night? Raise your hand. That, I'm impressed. You guys are a wild bunch. Um, many of you stayed up past uh, midnight, and you're here today. And I tell you, that makes me feel good. I'm glad you joined us for worship. And in a sense, this is such a a good way to start off a new year, isn't it? Uh, Within the rhythms of our life, we were created, we are wired to worship. And God has set for us a pattern, right, that we would come together um, weekly and that we would adjust our view and our perspective would be changed, centered around Him and His priorities. And so it's a good thing you're here today. If you haven't been in worship in a while, and perhaps you're just here because, hey, it's the, the want to start the year off in a different way, you made a good decision um, because this is a good place to be as we gather together with other Christians, with other believers, and we encourage one another through our singing as we pray together and as we dive into God's Word together as well. And I'm excited about this next year for our church and some of the things that are going to be taking place. And um, just a reminder for those of you guys who are community group leaders, whether it be on Sunday morning or Sunday nights, uh, this coming Saturday, we're going to be having our leadership brunch. And it's just another opportunity for us to get together and uh, let you share with you some things that are happening to get some feedback from you. And so that's this Saturday. And so if you haven't registered for that, um, you can do so on the app or you can stop by the Connection Center. If you don't know how to work the app, they can help you. Or you can just stop by the Connection Center and say, hey, I need to sign up for the leadership brunch. I don't know how to do that on the app, but I know that I need to sign up. And so community group leaders, make sure you remember that before you leave today. That's this Saturday. Uh, we'll feed you a good brunch. And then we're going to give you um, some, uh, let's share with you some things that are coming up in the next, next few weeks and over the next, uh, next year. Well, January uh, for most of us is usually a very hopeful time, isn't it? Uh, It's an opportunity for us to uh, think back through this past year, right? Look over the calendar and at least in our minds and, and think about life and how it went. It's also an opportunity for us to think ahead and to think how we want to live differently, uh, maybe we, we look in the mirror and we don't necessarily love what we see, so we want to make some changes. Or uh, we imagine how life could be different usually this time of year or should be different. And so we mark those changes and then we kind of set out a path on how we want to change. And what I have learned as far as New Year's resolutions and just wanting to change is this, is that the desire for change and seeing it happen are not the same thing, are they? They're not the same thing. Uh, We may have a desire to change, but often that change may or may not come into fruition. And it's funny, of all the different ways that that society has helped create for us to to change, even think about changing physically, that's one of the uh, biggest resolutions people have at the beginning of the year, right? To, to lose weight or to, to work out, be, become healthier. And, and these days, there's all kinds of advancements in doing that. You can buy a Fitbit, you know, you can buy the, the Peloton, the bike, and, and, you know, you can have a trainer there right in your own home taking you up a mountain. Uh, there's all kinds of ways that uh, society and marketing and, and just companies have made it easier to accomplish the things physically that we want to accomplish, but it still doesn't change us, does it? We may have that desire and they may put tools in our hands, but it takes more than just tools, doesn't it? Uh, You can learn a a particular method or you can apply a method and it may provide a path for you to change, but those things don't necessarily supply you with the power to change. And I would say that's the same thing even spiritually. Right? Even spiritually, we can look at our lives, and, and obviously, God cares about our whole lives. He cares about our bodies and our souls. Um, but even when we think about our lives in relation to our relationship with God, there are probably some things that, that maybe you want to do differently. There's some struggles you want to overcome. 
Uh, maybe there is a commitment you would like to, to see yourself keep through this year. We have goals and we, we have areas of our life, even our spiritual life, where we want to see growth. But as we look closely at, at how that happens, we realize that transformation is just not a matter of our work, right, of how hard we work. Transformation, spiritually especially, is a matter of worship. And that's where Paul is going to take us this morning in Romans chapter 12. That real change is not fueled by our necessarily the methods that we use or by our own effort or work. No, real change, real transformation is fueled by our worship. And so we're going to look at these two verses over the next couple of weeks, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And so let's read them together this morning. Paul writes this. He says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. You know, the book of Romans doesn't read like many of the other writings of Paul in the New Testament. It's not written per se as a letter as much as it is as a theological treatise. Uh, In fact, for the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans, Paul lays out what God has as done in the gospel, how God has chosen to redeem a fallen world to himself through the gospel, through faith in Christ. And, and then from chapter 12 on, he transitions. Paul shifts his focus to how they should live in light of what God has done in the gospel. So the first 11 chapters is, is, is more theology, right, is, is doctrine-based. It's, it's this picture of what God has done. And then from chapter 12 on, it shifts to what we must do in light of what God has done. And these first two verses in chapter 12 are the hinge on which this shift takes place in the book of Romans. And notice what brings these two things together, what God has done and now what we must do. What brings these two things together is worship. In fact, look, look, look again there in verse 1. He says, we're to live, offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Underline that word worship because I think it's key here as we move forward and we understand how transformation truly takes place. Worship is this continuous outpouring, right, of, of all that I am, all that I do, all that I can become. That's, that's worship. And it's in response to God or, or you can even say a God because all of us, uh, some of our worship is not necessarily to the God, but it may be to a God in our life. Worship is more than what we just do in this room. And you know that. It's what we do with our lives. We are shaped ultimately by what we worship. We, uh, it's what we lay down our lives for. And we worship what we value, don't we? We live according to what we value. Um, good example is this, is if you have decided it would be a good idea to become more fit, right? This next year you decided I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk more, I'm going to lift weights, or I'm going to exercise or whatever, where, where, however you're choosing to go about that. You can lay it out, right? You can mark the benefits. If I do this over the course of the next couple of months, this is what the results will, will be. And you can go out and you can get on the elliptical and you can buy the heat gear, the cold gear. You can spend a lot of money. You can buy the, um, the treadmill and put it in your house or, um, and you can, you can exercise. Uh, you, you can make these plans to exercise, but when it comes down to it, whether you exercise or not will be based on what you value. And if you value your comfort more than you value getting healthy, then guess what? You're not going to exercise. It doesn't matter what else you do. If you value being comfortable and kind of in just enjoying yourself as you've been enjoying yourself, it doesn't matter what plans you make to what changes you desire to make in your life because you're going to be shaped not by what you desire but what you value. 
And for the Christian, listen, worship is this. Here's a good definition for worship. Worship is ascribing worth to God as a response to who he is and what he has done. It's ascribing worth to God as a response to who he is and what he's done. Now, notice I didn't say giving worth to God or adding worth to God. We cannot add worth to God. We cannot necessarily give worth to God. But we can step back and recognize God's worth. And so that's what I mean when I say the word ascribe. As we, as we step back and we recognize and we give praise to God because we, we recognize his worth as a response to who he is and what he's done. We see his great value, and in light of his great value, we give him worth. We choose to recognize that value with, it, with our lives. And we see this definition here even in verse 1. Notice again what it says. He says, in view of God's, in view of the mercies of God. What is, what is Paul instructing them to do? He's saying, first of all, you need to recognize the mercy of God, who God is and what he has done. And then how are we to respond? We respond by presenting our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. So we see this. We see, first of all, us recognizing who God is and what he's done, and then we respond. And that's that's worship. And this is what Paul is directing them here to do in verse 1, to to see and, 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 and recognize the mercies of God and then also to offer your body as a living sacrifice in response to the mercies of God, who God is and what he has done. And that idea of living, uh, offering your body as a living sacrifice, your life as a living sacrifice, uh, that's an Old Testament picture, right? And, and in many ways it's um, for, the, for the readers here in Rome, the believers, um, some of them were Jewish, some of them were Gentile, but for both of them, that sounded somewhat like an oxymoron, a living sacrifice. Because when they thought about sacrificing, they thought of death. It was, uh, it was when you would bring a, an offering, an animal to the tabernacle or to the temple, and they were living. But the main picture of the sacrifice on the altar was one of death, right? The animal would be would be um, killed there at the altar and would be consumed on the altar. And so when we think about our bodies as living sacrifices, right, there is a death that takes place. There is a death to sin and self. But then also it's a living sacrifice because there's a life to be lived. And he says what kind of life we're to live. We're to live a life that's holy, a life that's set apart, a, a life that's pleasing to God, a life which is acceptable to God. This is the life that is offered to God and is to be consumed by God. And Paul writes, this is true worship. If you want to know what true worship is, it's offering your life to God as a living sacrifice, dying to sin and to self and offering your life to be consumed by the purposes of God and worship of God. This is, this is, this is your, um, it may say spiritual worship in your translation or even reasonable. The Greek word is actually the word we get the English word logical for. It's a logical um, uh, worship. And what Paul is saying here is that it's, logical, it's a logical response to, to God for what he has done, for who he is and what he's done, to offer your very life. In fact, it's the, only, it's the only response to God that makes sense. If you truly see God for who he is and what he's done, the only reaction that corresponds correctly to truly seeing who God is, what he's, did, what he's done, again, is to offer your entire life in total surrender to him. Jesus puts it like this in Matthew chapter 13. Jesus says this, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field that a man found and re buried. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. And then he goes on. It says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he found one priceless pearl, he went and sold everything he had and he bought it. This is, this is worship. And so when we see the mercies of God, when we see the greatness of God and what God has done and in our awe, in our complete 
astonishment. We take everything we have and we offer to God in return. That's our response. This past um, November when we were flying to India, we missed our flight in Chicago. We, we got out of Nashville a little later than we wanted to. When we got to Chicago, the, uh, you had to kind of basically go out of security and go back through security, and there were hundreds of people in security. And so Al and I were kind of standing in the back of the, the security line. We only had 30 minutes or so to get to our, maybe less than that actually, to get to the desk, to get to our flight. To our, and our next flight was, was basically to Qatar. So it was, uh, you know, uh, the, the big flight. And so we stood back there, and then there was this lady who, I guess, a little bit more aggressive than us. And she had to catch her flight. And so she started cutting, darting through the crowd, right, with her luggage and, and saying, excuse me, excuse me. And, uh, and basically, I drafted behind her. Like, I got right behind her, and Alan somehow got behind me. We're both bigger than her, right, but we're hunched down. It's like we've created a conga line, and we're, we're navigating through hundreds of people who probably are frustrated we're doing this. We're not, we're not asking their permission. We're just kind of going with her, right? She was very bold. And so we get up there, and we still miss our flight. And so um, as we're standing there at the desk, it was us two and another guy that we all missed our flights. And so his name was Mark, and we got to know him a little bit. And Mark, it turns out, once again, he was going to get on the same flight we were the next day. So we spent the night at the hotel in Chicago. We had dinner together. And Mark and his family lived uh, what I would say was, it was kind of an extraordinary life. Um, he basically, his, his wife and his two kids, they used to live in Colorado. They sold their home. And then he bought a, a 40-foot uh, catamaran yacht, okay? And, um, and that's now where they live. 40 feet, okay? And 40 feet's a big boat, but not when you consider it's, it's like now his house, right, for four people. And they basically sailed around the world, and now they live in Malaysia. They live in this boat in Malaysia, and he works for a company where he helps sell these boats and have these incredible adventures. And, and you know, he was talking to us about, hey, you know, you guys, you know, you guys ought to think about this. And I'm like, Mark, you know, I can't I can't drive my wife to Medina without her getting car sick. Um, so I don't think this is going to be an option for the Neely family, although it sounds extraordinary for you, right? I'm amazed at your life. And not only that, but I just started thinking, you know, imagine getting on this 40-foot yacht and, you know, just sailing for a couple of weeks out in the Pacific Ocean and sitting out there. I asked him, I said, you know, what? What kind of feeling is that when you sail that far out in the ocean and you, you just get up one morning and you see nothing, you know, except just water? And he said, you feel so small, right? You feel so small. And I, I, I would, honestly, I would be freaked out by that confession here. I, I, I would like to see land. I, I, I can't handle feeling that small, especially when you... Even, you know, sometimes it happens when you get up in a plane, right? When you, especially if you're in a very small plane. And you, and you look out and you see such this vast sky, right? And you just feel overwhelmed. It's like, uh, we've, Ellen and I have been to the Grand Canyon. It's like standing on, the, on the, the rim of the Grand Canyon and looking down. Once again, you, you feel so tall, small. You feel you're in awe of how big of, what, of, of the world, how big the world is. In the same way, that's the picture, I think, of what we see happening here in, in Romans chapter, and really throughout the book of Romans. Paul is, 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 through the book of Romans, he's taking on us a journey to the realm of the Grand Canyon. And helping us see the magnitude of who God is and what he has done. And, and he begins in, in chapter 1 of this 11-chapter journey. And he begins talking about how God created us to, to know him and to, to worship him. And this is why he has um, put together all of creation as evidence of the reality of, of God. And then as he continues on in chapter 1, he says, but instead of us acknowledging God to be God, God to be creator of God, instead we chose to, to worship the created. We did the most backwards thing in humanity as we took the gifts 
God created for us to recognize and to give him praise. And we, and we made the gifts God. We made creation God. And we rejected God. Yet, even though we rejected God and we deserved and, and because of our choices, God turned us over to our choices. He, he let us make that choice. And we experienced separation from God. And Romans says we were objects of the wrath of God, deserving the judgment of God. But, but God did the most amazing thing in the midst of our rejecting of him. God chose to pursue us while we were shaking our fist at him. God chose to send his, his one and only son for us. And, and on the cross, this creator God satisfied his wrath through the death of his only son. His innocent, righteous son took what we deserved. And he didn't just let us off the hook and say, good luck. No, he, he gave us his son's righteousness. And he brought us into his family. And he gave us seats at the table as sons and daughters of, of God. And this is... This is the, the first 11 chapters of, of Romans. And, and Paul is walking, slowly walking the, the believers in Rome through this book and describing all that God has done. And by the time he gets to the end of chapter 11, he is in awe. He is standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon, realizing the magnitude of who God is and how small he is. And he can't but help erupt in praise at all that he is all that, all that he has witnessed that God has done. And in the end of chapter 11, he, he begins singing this hymn. He says, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and of the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor and who has ever given to God that he should be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Paul is like shaking up a carbonated beverage, right, and taking off the, the lid. He's just spewing. He's erupting in, in praise. He says, behold, what God has done. And he's in awe of it. He can't believe it. And his life has been changed by it. His future is changed by it. And this morning, listen, if you were a believer, Paul's view here is your view. It should be your view. Do, do you see it? Do you see the gospel with this kind of awe? Because, my friends, here is the, the power to change. Okay? The power to change is, in, is when we step back and we're in awe, when we see the greatness of, what, of who God is and what he's done in the gospel. My friends, that is what fuels our worship, and worship is what fuels real change. One thing that I've said before, typically this time of year, is this, is that real transformation does not begin with battling self. It begins with beholding God. Real change in, in your walk with the Lord and in your life doesn't, doesn't start with, with looking in the mirror. It doesn't start with, with acknowledging or, or focusing upon um, yourself. Right? Here, here's typically what happens. We, we feel guilty. We, we beat ourselves up. Um, we even shame ourselves, right? That's typically the way that we, we feel and about the ways we don't feel like we're living up to what God desires for us to do. We, we, we look in the mirror, we, we feel guilt, we shame ourselves. And then we decide what we must do, right? We get together a plan. We get together the right resources. But real transformation is hard, isn't it? I mean, we slip up, and then we feel bad, and then we slip up again, and then we feel worse, and our willpower is, is limited, isn't it? We can only make it so far, and it's like we, we run out of fuel, and then we crash and burn. 
But what Paul is leading us to see here is that the power for you to change is not found in you. Our strength and our, and our will and our power to change is found in the gospel. It's by stepping back and being in awe of what God has done, of who God is. That's, that's where our fuel for change comes from. That's where transformation must begin. And so in light of that, here's really the, the one truth that I want you to walk away with here this morning is this, is that we must live our lives in daily view of the gospel. If real tr- transformation begins with beholding God, then that means this, that for you to truly grow and to be transformed in your relationship with God, for you to, listen, to even thinking about that sin that you struggle with, is it just a matter of, of adopting all these external habits or is it more than that? Because, listen, uh, more than likely you've been there. You've, you've struggled with a particular sin or issue in your life. And so you've tried to place all these external controls on yourself. And you find yourself back in the same place that you were over and over again. And, my friends, that's because transformation is not an outside-in thing. It's an inside-out thing. And it's not believing in yourself. When I say inside out, it, it, it doesn't mean that, okay, I'm going to really believe in myself this time. If I, you know, I can do it if I just believe. No. It's about the gospel, right? Recognizing the gospel and Christ in you. That's what I mean by inside out thing. That's where change takes, that's where change begins. That's how change truly takes place. And so for for you to really be transformed, then you have to daily live your life in view of the gospel. Notice this idea of offering your your life as a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice, uh, an old old preacher, I don't know if it's a joke or line here is this. The problem with the living sacrifice is it keeps crawling off the altar, right? And so daily we have to put ourselves on the altar. Daily we have to offer our lives. All you are, all you will become to God, right? You do that daily. And so daily we have to live in view of the gospel. Not your latest achievement. That's, here, here's some of the things that we typically live in view of. We, we live in view of our, our most recent achievement. And if we've accomplished something we think worthwhile in our lives, we feel good about ourselves. All of a sudden, we feel powerful, don't we? Or many of us live in view of just the opposite. We always live in view of our latest failure. But we failed again. I've done it again. And then you feel powerless. And both those are mirages, Right? feeling powerful in your own strength and feeling powerless without any strength. Both those things are illusions when it comes to real transformation. Many of you live in view of of a broken heart. Maybe there's a relationship. And so you, you see your life through brokenness, through someone who has broken trust, through someone who is broken their word. And everything you see is in view of that broken relationship. Maybe you're here and you live your life in view of a prodigal child. Maybe you have a son or a daughter that's not walking with the Lord, that's walking away from the Lord. And, and every morning you, you wake up and that's, that's the, the primary reality, defining thing in your life, weight you feel. And so you, you view your life through that. Other people view their lives through their current struggle with sin. You, you base everything in your relationship with God upon this one particular issue that you continue to struggle with. My friends, that's not how we're to live our life in view. Uh, other people in, live their life in view perhaps of a mother or a father who, who never loved you or, or a spouse or a supervisor at work who doesn't appreciate you. Listen, there's a number of things that we can wake up daily and view in the background of our lives. And Paul is saying, listen, if you truly want to be transformed, 
then you live your life in view of the mercies of God. Christian, the defining reality of your life, the soundtrack of your life that you should be hitting on repeat is the truth of the gospel. That each day you would wake up and you would be reminded of who God is and what he has done through his son, Jesus Christ, and that it is a finished work. Do you realize that God wants you to be transformed? God has already transformed you. You're just not there yet. Right? We've been, as Christians, we've been predestined, right, to be transformed into the image of of Jesus Christ. God has done this, right? If you are a Christian, God in positionally has already made you holy. He's already made you blameless. He has already transformed you. He has already perfected you. Practically, right, sanctification, we're still working that out. But my friends, it is a done deal. And so none of us can sit back and say, well, man, change is just too hard. God, I want to change, but I just can't change. I just can't be transformed. No, God desires for for you to change. God desires for you to be transformed and has already, in reality, accomplished it. This is, once again, this is stepping back and seeing, living your life in view of, of the gospel. And practically, what what does this look like? Well, in some ways, we're doing that this morning. How do you live your life in view of the gospel? Well, one way is is you gather regularly with the church. And someone who does not gather regularly, and when when I say regularly, I say, I mean weekly. Scripture seems to, to lay out, right, this idea of weekly, right, where the calendar was, was created like this weekly rhythms. And so, my friends, one of the things that you can do to live your life in view of the gospel, this is this constant awareness of who God is and what he's done and how he feels about you and his mercy is that you would gather weekly with, with other believers in worship, right, to gather together with the church. And if, if you're not doing that, then, my friends, I don't, I don't know anything easier to do than that. That's where it begins. And uh, another way I would encourage you is even throughout the week. And and once again, if you're here and you're a member of West Jackson, we're going to start midweek again on Wednesday nights for for children and for youth and for college students and for adults and and all this. I mean, parents, this is important for you to uh, listen. if, If the gospel is the primary way... If our worship to God is the most important thing in our life, which obviously it should be, then we have to orient ourselves around those truths. We have to put ourselves in in seats where we can constantly be reminded of who God is and what he's done. And another way we can do that is is just through, once again, being here, gathering together. And on Wednesday nights, I know for the adults, this went uh, on Wednesday nights this semester, um, we're going to be walking through some of the, the doctrines of the church. So specifically, we're going to be looking at the, the Baptist faith and message. And we're going to be reminded of these things that God has done that, that we can believe in. And what they're meant to do is not for just to fill your head with knowledge, but they're, they're meant to lead you to worship. They're, they're to cause you to ascribe worth to God, to give worth to God, worship to God based on what he's done. And uh, that's another reason we're, we're starting again with a Bible reading plan. And this year we're going to be uh, here at West Jackson, we're working through the, the New Testament. Uh, just a, a chapter a day. But my friends, I don't know of anything that will, that will help you in this process of transformation in your relationship with the Lord than, than you reading the Bible daily. I had somebody even last week, they, uh, this past year we read through the the Old Testament and the New Testament, and uh, we had a, there's a printed copy, and they gave me the printed copy, and they had all the days marked off. And that's like the best Christmas gift you could give me right there as your pastor to see that you are engaged in the Word. And my friends, I would say, listen, if you want to live your life in view of the gospel, give yourself to reading Scripture. Uh, don't, let the be the fir- don't let the first thing you grab when you wake up in the morning be your cell phone. Because when you grab your cell phone and when you turn it on, you are opening yourself up to the world. 
You really are. When that screen comes on, you're opening yourself up to be influenced by by millions of people and, and, and the message that's being portrayed through the world, right? One of the things you see immediately is the news, the latest news. You can screen over and see what's happening. And, or you can be caught by a text or an email from the outside. And, and pretty soon, what's shaping your reality? It's, it's, the, it's the viewpoint that's coming in through your phone instead of the truth of the, of the of Scripture. And so I would, I would urge you, as Paul urges you to this year, to, to get it a reading plan. We'd love for you to join us in the, in the New Testament reading plan. You can download on the app. It starts today or actually tomorrow. It's a, it's a Monday through Friday plan. If you miss a couple of days, you can catch up on Friday and Saturday. And, and the neat thing to do is we do it together as a church. You have other people that you can talk to about what you're reading. And you can even get together. We've had groups this past year that got together weekly with three to five other believers. And they talked about Scripture together. And they talked about how it was impacting your life. And they, they prayed for one another. Another way, and this might be surprising, that we can live in view of the mercies of God is through practicing confession. And this is something that I've had to learn as, as an adult. This is not something I'm sure I was taught as a child and taught as a teenager, but it's not something that maybe I actively practice. But confession is so important and understanding and, and, and being able to experience the mercies of God in your life, the forgiveness of God, the love of God in your life. And, and Jesus alludes to it. You know, when he, remember when he was speaking to that woman and the Pharisee, and she comes in and her sin is so apparent to everyone. And the Pharisee steps back and he says, Jesus, if you knew this woman, you would not allow her to touch you. And then Jesus compares the two, but kind of his defining statement in that, in that passage is that he who loves little has been forgiven little, but he who loves a lot has been forgiven a lot, recognizes they've been forgiven a lot. And so what that means is, my friends, when we understand the depth of God's forgiveness in our lives, it increases our love for him. It widens our hearts and we begin to be in awe and worship of him. And so confession is important for you, not for the Christian because, uh, because you're not forgiven until you confess your sin. No, right? We know that we're forgiven of our sins when we trust in Christ as Lord and Savior. But confession opens the door to experience God's mercy in our lives again. To experience his forgiveness. And so confession is another way that you can daily wake up and, and live in view of God's mercy. As you confess, listen, you begin with who he is, but then as you confess who you are not, you're reminded that your, your status before him is not based upon your performance. Now we confess, what draws us into confession is his kindness, is his love and his forgiveness. So, my friends, this year, how do you plan on living in view of the gospel? Because as we live in view of the mercy of God, we will respond. If we truly see God and what he has done, it will lead us to worship. And our worship is, it will, be, will, will be fuel for transformation. And we're going to see more about that transformation next week. But... I wanted to end by in, in a couple of ways. First of all, I would say this, that if you're not a believer, I would say that all of us worship, all of us worship something. That worship is, is an activity of the human heart. It's something that you are wired to do. And whatever you are worshiping, you are giving yourself to. Basically, you're putting yourself under the control of. Now, friends, if, if you're not a Christian, what, what better way? Who better to trust with your life? Who better to put in control of your life than a God who loves you so much that he would give his son for you? That he would not spare his son for you. Who, who better to, to yield and surrender your life to than that God? And I would say this morning, if you are a Christian, Elizabeth Elliot 
talks about Romans 12, 1. Elizabeth Elliot may remember she lost her husband, Jim Elliot, uh, as a martyr and then proceeded to share the gospel of those who took the life of her husband. And she's a prolific author and writer and thinker and even theologian. And, and she talks about not just, all, uh, she gets specific in this idea of offering our lives to God. And she writes this, she says, God knows your heart and will accept your offering any way you make it, I'm sure. But a very simple thing has helped me. It is to kneel with open hands before the Lord. Be silent for a few minutes, putting yourself consciously in his presence. Think of him. Think of what he's done. And then think of what you have received in your life. And by received in your life, she means this. Think of the things that the person you are, the person God has made you. Think of the things you have. Think of your possessions. Think of the things you do, right, you're, you're a, you, that you're about. And then she says, also, think of the things you suffer. Think of those things. Visualize those things. And as well as you can, rest those things in your open hands like a gift. And thank the Lord whatever aspect of this gift you can honestly thank him for and then quite simply offer it up to him who you are what you what you do all that you have even those ways that you suffer even those ways where life doesn't make sense to you that that's a struggle to take those things and offer them to God open your hands as a gift Maybe that's a specific way this morning that you can be led in offering your life as a living sacrifice to the Lord. Let's pray together.